Hello, Kidney Warriors! James here from Dadvice TV, your online kidney health coach, and this is another episode of Dadvice TV Live. It is great to have all you here, and if you're brand new, welcome. You're going to love it. We got lots of great information, science-based information, to help you live with kidney disease, better understand it, and hopefully improve your quality of life. Now today, we're going to talk about something that actually is pretty confusing to a lot of people. So you start off, you get diagnosed with kidney disease, and you got to learn how to eat this new diet. And at first, it seems really hard. What the heck can I eat? What can I not eat? How much? But if you work with a renal dietitian, it gets a lot easier. But today's topic is what happens when you have two different diets that kind of don't seem to meld together very well. A renal diet, otherwise known as a kidney diet, and a diabetic diet. Now to talk about this, we got to bring in an expert. We are going to bring in renal dietitian Jen Hernandez from Plant Powered Kidneys. Hey, Jen, how you doing? Hey, James. Hey, everybody. Doing so wonderful. Checking in with you all this beautiful Tuesday evening and very excited. We get to talk about two diets for the time of one. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> now, could tell people about plant-based power or plant-powered kidneys in case they're brand new. Yeah. So I've been a renal dietitian for, um, oh man, going on. Um, okay. I don't keep track of time. So that's the start there. Uh, I bet I've been a dietitian since, uh, 2012 working in dialysis hospitals and, uh, also with the kidney foundation doing early intervention, kidney screenings. And I've been very interested in preventive kidney nutrition especially when I was working in dialysis. And that led me to open up Plant Powered Kidneys, which is a virtual private practice. We see clients throughout the United States here, and it's all just like this. We do our video chats and connect with clients from across the country. So that is what we do here at Plant Powered Kidneys. And what I also love to encourage is the information at plantpoweredkidneys.com as well as our free Facebook group. That is growing. We're almost at 5,000 members in there. I cannot believe, I know it is growing so fast. And the recipes, and the food, all the pictures people share, the different types of things that they're eating and enjoying in their diet is always so nice to see. Watching people grow gardens and it's, it's just absolutely motivating and inspiring to see all the different kinds of foods that can fit into a plant-based renal diet. So uh, tonight we're going to be talking about the renal diet when diabetes is involved, which is a really important conversation because diabetes is the top cause of CKD. Uh, yeah, exactly. And I want to comment on one of the posts that I just saw maybe an hour ago in Plant Powered Kidneys Facebook group. Um, someone, he didn't have any pictures because he said he ate it and it was so good before he realized I need to take a picture. But he posted a recipe for making uh, kind of his version of like egg rolls that was kidney friendly. And it sounded great. And he talked about the substitutions he did. So if you don't currently belong to the Plant Powered Kidneys Facebook group. Go over there and join. Tons of great ideas to help you add variety um, and kind of you know, keep loving eating food because you know, that's one of the things I actually love a lot. <laughs> <laughs> now, all of us here, we're pretty familiar with the basic renal diet, but the diabetic diet, we really haven't spoken about that much here. So mm -hmm. what really is a diabetic diet before we get into how to blend them? Yeah, uh, and that's a really important thing to consider because when you have kidney issues that have come from diabetic issues, you really want to understand those fundamentals before you try tacking on this whole other uh, situation with the diet. So there are two types of diabetes, first of all, and it's important to understand which one you have because you want to know what your body's doing when it's trying to take care of sugars. So first of all, there's type one diabetes and type one is when a person doesn't make insulin. So insulin is made in our pancreas, but there are people who are born or from an early, uh, an early age, they find out that they don't make insulin. 
And insulin is supposed to help bring sugars from the blood into the cell where it's used for energy. So type one, a lot of people think of it as juvenile or yep. early diabetes, that, that kind of thing, because you find out about it at an earlier age. So yeah, and one of my remember, nieces is type one. So I'm pretty familiar with it. Yeah. So in those cases, um, your your niece is probably in the situation where maybe an insulin pump is needed yep. or some kind She's of insulin routine. Yeah, there's something that needs to be giving the body insulin so that the body can take the sugars from the blood into the cells. So that's type one, doesn't make insulin. Then we have type two, and type two is more so known as like adult onset diabetes because it is something that develops most often later in life, although we do see it in um, young people as well still. Mm -hmm but it's more later in life. And what this is, is insulin resistant diabetes. So this is where the body does make insulin, but it's not being seen by the cells. It's not being aware that, that the cell or that the insulin is there to bring the glucose, to bring the sugar in from the blood into the cell. So then the blood sugars can end up being high or low. They just kind of stay out of control because the insulin isn't being utilized properly. So people with type two may need insulin or some oral uh, diabetic medications as well to help with increasing the insulin that's already in the body. So that's type two diabetes. So it's either not having insulin at all or not utilizing, not using the insulin that is in the body. Mm -hmm. Now with the diabetic diet, because we're talking about the sugars in the blood, the number one thing people start thinking of is yeah, sugar and carbohydrates. And that's a big focus of the diabetic diet. So we talk about things like your starches, which is your bread, your pastas, your rice, your grains, your cereals. We're talking about fruits, even starchy vegetables. We're talking about dairy products. And of course the fun treats, the sugars and desserts mm. and sweets and all those kind of good stuff. So these are the big, this is the big group of the carbohydrates that we focus on in the diabetic diet as far as not restricting necessarily. In some cases that can be helpful is being careful with how much you have, but getting on more of a consistent intake. So people with type one will be doing things like carb counting. So they know how much insulin to give themselves. They give the right amount of insulin compared to how much carbs they're eating. Yep. With type two, there's some uh, focus on maybe looking at the different macros, looking at fats and proteins as well, which is still helpful for type one. But with type two, there, there can be more of a, a timing so that we're not getting these big spikes and dips. And it happens in both cases. But um, in type two, that's also something really commonly seen. And this still goes back to looking at the macronutrient that is carbohydrates and trying to be more consistent. So one of the top recommendations is focusing on eating every like two to four hours. You don't want to go too long without eating because that's when your sugar can drop. Right. I've had and it. Then, <laughs> then you eat it spikes. Yeah. So we're not we're and, not trying to eliminate carbs. We're trying to control mm -hmm. them and keep our blood sugar pretty stable as much as we exactly. can throughout the day. Exactly. And that's where it comes into some portion control. Um, and then also not skipping meals, not avoiding meals. That's when your blood sugar crashes. And it's kind of, I mean, James, you know, I use car analogies all the time. Yep. Hey, same here. I don't know why. <laughs> I don't know why, but um, it's, it's the other one I was thinking of later today after I did my live from this morning, I was thinking like, it's kind of like driving on ice and you hit a patch and then you automatically kind of pull the wheel. You have that reaction, that jerk reaction. And where you risk is you risk overcorrecting, right? Mm -hmm. That's exactly. the same thing with sugars. If it gets too low, you risk feeling really cruddy and you know, oh my gosh, I need to get sugar in my system. And so what do people go for? They go for soda, they go for candy, they go for juice, they go for something that's going to shoot their sugar up fast yep. so they can stop feeling cruddy. But then it overcompensates and then it gets too high and then we're like, well, okay, now we have a high sugar that we've got to take care of. So that's why you don't want to go too long and run into that issue. The other analogy I used was driving on, uh, driving with gas and my dad would always teach me you got to fill up your tank when it's at a half tank. You don't want to wait until it's all the way down. That was me. Don't, don't, don't get yeah. to where it's too low and you're yeah. risking things. 
Exactly. So that's why I think of it too. You, you don't want to leave your tank too empty mm -hmm. because you don't want to have to all of a sudden put a bunch into it to get it full again. So around that half empty tank time is when you want to put something back in. Now, diabetics, it's more than just carbs because I know mm -hmm. protein is a very important mm -hmm. thing for them and that we've talked about it many times going extremely low protein is not a good thing for people who are diabetic. Yeah. And, and this is something, um, this is something where I talked this morning about how it's kind of on both sides of the, of the coin here. When we talk about the renal diabetic diet, that it's something that you want to include, but when we're again, focusing on the kidney side of things, we don't want to do too much. So that's when it comes down to like your choice of protein, making sure that you're not taking anything that that's going to be super high in protein that can then harm your kidneys. So the protein is really a balancing part, just like the carbohydrates is or carbohydrates are. And that's, that's where I really have a hard time with some of these fad diets that talk about eliminating any kind of nutrient, whether, I mean, most times it's carbs or fat. Not a lot of people think about protein unless you're in the kidney world and then you're more mm -hmm. familiar with it. But anytime we talk about pulling a macronutrient out entirely, you've got to adjust your other values somehow. And that makes it really difficult and more restrictive when we do that. So protein is definitely something to include in both the diabetic diet and the renal diet, but the amount is going to vary depending on each of those individual situations. Okay, a lot of information right there to absorb. Um, yeah. So when I'm starting, or if I'm on a kidney-friendly diabetic diet, I'm now merging the two of these. Um, mm -hmm. What really is the difference compared to a regular renal diet as far as what I eat? So honestly, if I could like save people, I don't know, if they need to sign off early, it's not that much different. It's really not that much different. A lot of the things that we talk about with just a good renal diet is still going to be very good for the diabetic side of things too. What can really change is the quantity of the carbohydrates. And somebody asked me this morning about like, well, how much carbohydrates? That can be anywhere from 45 to 65% of your daily caloric needs. That's It's a really big range. But the carbohydrates, glucose is the number one source of energy for our brains. It's the number one source of energy for our body. So it makes sense that it's going to be about half of our daily intake that we do need from carbohydrates. Now, some people do benefit from a little bit lower on the carbohydrate side. And there are studies that do look at lower carbohydrate diets for people with diabetes, not a ton looking at lower carb with low protein, like looking at all these other factors related to CKD, not on dialysis. Um, CKD on dialysis can be a little bit different because people on dialysis need more protein. They need yep. the protein to replenish what's being taken out in dialysis. So there is more flexibility to be a little bit lower on the carb side. But for somebody CKD with diabetes, yet not on dialysis, there is a, there's, um, less flexibility, I would say. There's more things to be cautious of that you're being protective of that kidney function you have left. Now, when it comes to carbs, the type of carb really does matter. And we, we've talked about that a bit before. Can you talk more about that? Yeah, and, and this is, again, one of the biggest things when we talk about carbohydrates in the renal diabetic diet or in just the diabetic diet, it's quality not always quantity. And I still am a big promoter of whole grains. And we've yes. talked about whole grains from before about people worrying about phosphorus, sometimes potassium even. But honestly, the benefits that have been proven from whole grains really outweigh any of the potential risks. And some of them are even just potential, not really justified. Mm -hmm. uh, but the whole grains provide so much more value for what you're getting out of them. One of the biggest things is a whole grain is something that comes with carbohydrate, I'm sorry, something that comes with fiber. And fiber is the Mack truck. We've talked about this, another yeah, car Fiber analogy. is your friend. 
<laughs> yes, fiber is the Mack truck on the freeway that slows everybody down. Nobody can go fast. So blood sugars really slow down the absorption because the body is working through this Mack truck that is slowing everybody down for this absorption. So fiber, so, so important. And that's how you, that's where you're going to get it is in whole grains. You can also get it from fruits and vegetables, which also do have carbohydrates in them. So it's another reason to justify fruits and vegetables too, that you're getting fiber there as well. Yeah. So, so that that's a really, really big factor when choosing the right kind of carbohydrate. Yeah. So on bread, and we have a comment mm -hmm. about bread, um, the, the, the highly processed, highly refined, pretty much generic white bread um, mm -hmm. that I kind of grew up on as a kid is not the best choice. It's the ones that have that, you know, the wheat and stuff like that in it um, is a better choice. So I could simply make that swap. Um, do I need to look at the carb smart ones? Because now when you go to the grocery store and, and Connie brought this question up, you see carb smart all over the place, ice cream, uh, mm -hmm. and even in bread. Are those a better choice or is that just a marketing technique to maybe get some more money on some processed bread? I mean, that is a really good question. I would love to do a little bit of a price analysis and then also with the price compare the nutrition label to just a regular whole grain or regular whole wheat bread to see how much you're spending on maybe not a huge difference like it could be a three gram carbohydrate difference which is a drop in the bucket very yeah. very minuscule and if you're seeing that there's uh, alterations in the fiber or the sodium that's another factor um, that we'll definitely be talking about but sodium is another thing in breads that can be really sneaky and we don't realize it's adding up so when you're making a choice for your type of bread look at things like the sodium look for the added phosphorus still keep that renal stuff that we talk about here all the time keep that in mind but with the carbohydrates in general, so like a slice of bread, the standard slice of bread is going to be about 15 grams of carbs. So if you get one that's like extra thick, like the, the Texas toast kind, oh, or yeah. if My you get the that. large, <laughs> yeah, if you get like the large ones like that, that's, it could be a little, a couple grams over. If you mm -hmm. get the thin sliced ones, it might be a couple grams under. So it's going to be around that 15 gram range. I'm as far as like the carb smart, I don't know exactly how many grams of carbohydrates in there, but keep think of 15 grams as a standard serving for a carbohydrate. So compare that to the carb smart, um, labels that you come across and, and, you know, think about if that would be a good option or not. To me, I also still look at the sodium and I think, well, if the carbs, let's say the carb is like half, let's say it's like seven grams, but the sodium is the same amount as the other one. Well, then I just want to keep in mind, it doesn't mean I should eat two of those slices of bread because now I'm doubling my sodium intake there. Right. So you, we can't look at these things in little bubbles and only look at one factor. We've got to look at the big picture. And this is where it can get kind of overwhelming. I'm not going to lie, but this is also where a dietitian can come in and help you organize your priorities and understand what you should really focus on and what you don't need to worry about. And in some of those cases, you might have a dietitian say, don't worry about carb smart. Don't worry about that. Just do whole grains, focus on whole grains that are lower in sodium. And that could be a huge relief to know that you've given, you've been given the green light to yes. just focus on that. Yes. Cause you know, we have that problem internally as kidney patients where we want to say no, no, no. Um, you know, when it comes to like carbs, we may say, oh, carbs is bad. I, I'm going to remove all these things from my diet and I'm over restricting when I really mm -hmm. don't need to. And that's where a dietitian could really help you. And one of the things I benefited from a dietitian was they showed me some meals. They worked with me on what I like. And then it was easy to go, okay, this is my starting point. I can make substitutions and change this, which is swapping out something. So I had a starting exactly. place, which was great. Yeah. Yeah. It's always good to have that familiarity. I was talking with a client about that earlier today too. And we were talking about these different recipe ideas. And we we're talking about figuring out, um, looking at some recipes to make some veggie burgers for the summer for cookouts. And I just saw like the fireworks lighting up behind his eyes of <laughs> all of these ideas. And then he's like, well, now I can make meatballs and now I can do different, like I can do Southwestern flavor. I could do Italian flavor. I mean, once you get that pack, 
Yeah. Yeah. It really, really <laughs> helps give you that clarification and knowing where to go from there. And yep. everything else just kind of melts away because you're like, I don't need to worry about it. I don't need to worry about it. Yep. Now, someone had a great question. Um, Olivia was t was asking about protein. Um, are we talking about animal protein? Uh, what kind of protein does it matter if I am going on a diabetic renal diet? Yes. And this is where the renal side lays in a little more heavily. For somebody who only has diabetes, there may not be a big emphasis on the animal proteins, but well, at Plant Powered Kidneys, we do promote a plant-based diet. It's not necessarily vegan. And even in these cases, renal diabetic diet might not be entirely vegan, but we do like to focus on more of the lean and more of the plant proteins to be that protein source in the diet. So certain cuts of meat like chicken or fish can be leaner, but you want to be careful of some of the other ones that aren't so lean. And the other thing about the animal proteins is that they are very high in protein ounce for ounce. So a piece of chicken, I was giving this example this morning, a piece of chicken the size of my palm, not my whole hand, the size of my palm is going to give me over 20 grams of protein. In some cases, that could be near an entire day's worth of protein for somebody who's on a low protein diet or a very low protein diet. It can be very tough to fit in the rest of your daily intake, which mm -hmm. James, you, you use chronometer. So I know you're oh, familiar yeah. with how it adds up. You see like, oh, there's not, there's not a problem with getting the protein in from these different oh, foods. There is no, <laughs> that one you can get. And it, I feel like, like marketing and the food industry thinks protein is mm -hmm. the new hot thing. And it's added to everything. It seems like, and it's already so oh, yeah. easy to get protein. Absolutely. That's one of the biggest things I love, the biggest myths I love to dispel when people are thinking, oh, well, you know, vegan, you're not going to get enough protein. I'm like, oh, honey, please, let's, <laughs> don't worry. Don't worry. You're you going to get, get it. Spinach. It's easy. <laughs> yeah. Spinach has protein. Broccoli has protein. The grains have protein. If you were to look at the labels of the foods that you wouldn't even think of having protein, chances are there's some protein in there. Mm-hmm. Now, our, our, so our, our protein is one of our energy sources. So we're kind of watching our carbs a bit, um, mm -hmm. not going crazy on them. We got our proteins. What's our next energy source for our diet? So another thing that you want to include with the renal diabetic diet, we talked about protein, carbs. The next thing is healthy fats. So it's not just any kind of fats. Just like with the proteins, we talked about lean proteins. With your fat sources, it will give you a lot of energy. Calorie wise, fat has the highest amount of calorie when we're comparing gram to gram. So it's really about here, quality definitely over quantity because you're not gonna need too much of it, but the type is gonna make all the difference. So choosing heart healthy fats like the polyunsaturated fats, the monounsaturated fats, that have um, these include omega threes and omega sixes. These are the ones that are very heart healthy, which we know as uh, people with kidney disease, one of the biggest problems are cardiovascular issues. Cardiovascular disease is very, very common and heart failure is also common. So these are things that we wanna take care of for the cardiovascular system and our lipid profiles, those cholesterol levels. So choosing heart healthy fats are a great way to help support those goals as well as stay in line with both the renal and the diabetic diet. Mm -hmm. And fats is one of those areas where online, I have trouble going into a lot of the, the social message boards because I see so much incorrect information about fats, yeah. um, especially the good fats telling kidney patients, stay away from it, but it really is so important and it needs mm -hmm. to be part of our diet. Um, mm -hmm. And of course, for those of you that are listening, you know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about like oils, a great source of fat. Put it, I'll use it on a salad dressing. I use it for oh, yeah. cooking. Um, as a dietitian, a renal dietitian, someone who knows kidney disease, Jen, 
what are some kidney friendly oils that I sh I could include? I wanted to say should be including, but that I can include in my diet yeah. to get these healthy fats that I need. Yeah. Well, first of all, there are definitely kidney friendly oils. You and I are on the same page about this, that we know that healthy fats and oils are absolutely a great thing to include. And I have many clients that, again, when we talk about being careful with carbs and definitely being careful with protein, the thing that we have to increase to get enough calories in is the fat and the oils. Exactly. And it's a great, easy way to do it. So we're looking at olive oil is a fantastic easy oil for a nice creamy dressing, a nice oil vinaigrette dressing. It is amazing to even toss with your roasted vegetables. Avocado oil is my favorite. Those are my two, or, those are the two I go to, olive and avocado. Yeah, they're just so easy. And for the record, even though it's coming from avocado, it's not a source of potassium. So I, somebody had asked me about that earlier today. So avocados are high in potassium, yes, but I've caught, I'm sorry, avocado oil is not. So that's another great one. I love also promoting flaxseed oil. Flaxseed oil is an, an amazing source of omega-3s. And we typically do not get enough omega-3 from the diet. That's one of the supplements I recommend most often. But including flax oil into the diet can be a great way to get more of those really, really good heart healthy fats and give you more energy. And then another one that is one of my favorites by far is sesame oil mm, and good it, flavor exactly we don't really think of oils as having a ton of flavor i mean olive oil can um but typically we like we like them to be neutral because we were using them with whatever we're cooking but sesame oil is that difference in that it just adds in and you just do a drizzle over your stir fry or a salad or whatever it is and it adds a great amount of flavor. So that's another mm -hmm. one of my favorite ones. Yes, and oils are not bad. We even had Olivia, she mentioned, hey, I was even in some of those Facebook groups that say olive oil and avocado oil are bad for kidney patients. I, I, I guess you could say that if you have too much of anything, it's bad for kidney patients. Right. But using right. it the correct way, these things are giving you great heart healthy fats it's helping you in your meals mm -hmm. i've been using it i mean, all my gfr has done was gone up and hold stable um olive oil and avocado oil are not hurting me and i i i use them every single day yeah and i'll <laughs> say as a dietitian we go by evidence-based research evidence-based research mm -hmm. if the evidence changes if studies come out and say no oil, it's bad for you, and they have that research to back that up, then I will be here to tell you there's yeah. new research coming out to question it. But right now, the research is not saying that it's bad for you. There's no, there's not evidence to prove that avoiding this entire group of really good nutrient-dense food is going to damage kidneys, as long as you're using it, like you say, in moderation. You're using it as yep. part of your diet and not your whole diet. <laughs> Yeah, and the fact that the nutritional recommendations change is actually a really good point to to, to talk about for a second. Um, even in the last few years, I've seen recommendations change because they've got more data for a longer mm -hmm. term and they look at it and they make minor tweaks. So um, that's why a renal dietitian is such a good resource. They're staying up to date on these things. They're learning about them. Um, you may hear from somebody don't eat X and that's based on something from 20 years ago that they heard and they don't realize, oh, we learned that that wasn't accurate. Here's what it should be instead. Mm -hmm. Just like when they used to promote white bread as the number one bread for the renal diet. We know <laughs> now that it doesn't do anything. It doesn't do anything for us. <laughs> You know, I, I have I have a textbook somewhere. It's from 2007 for a, for nephrology, and mm -hmm. it recommends one can of Coke per meal. And it actually has Coke, the brand, in there. One can per meal. I'm like, what in was, the world? Was that chapter sponsored by Coke? <laughs> I think it was. That's what it felt like. It's like, wait a minute, how could there be anything? But back then, they just really... Whenever the book was created, that kept getting carried over until, mm -hmm. you know, it got removed in 2008 for this textbook. 
But it's just an example of, yeah, there was something that they thought was okay and it changed as they learned more information. Though I'm surprised exactly. by that one. I, I I can't imagine anyone ever thinking one soda um, <laughs> is is good. Though I, I guess in moderation, you know, you can work it in. You just gotta you just drinking a bunch of calories and sugar. You gotta do a lot of working that stuff off. Now, yeah, now speaking yeah, of I, fat, one thing I, I like for you to to explain, what is the difference between saturated and unsaturated? Because we, we kind of brushed over that real quickly. We did. Yeah, we did. Um, I knew we'd be getting into saturated fats more too, but it's definitely important to understand some of those. So saturated fats are essentially think of them as the fats that are solid at room temperature. So you put something out on the counter and if it is solid, it is considered a saturated fat. So we're thinking butter, lard, you know, Crisco, um, even coconut oil is considered saturated fat. And um, other types or other sources that have saturated fat are animal products. So animal meats, fatty meats, mm -hmm. as well as like basically the whole dairy line. So cheese, yogurt, milks that are of the whole fat variety. And these saturated fats are the kinds that are more detrimental to health. The way that the chemical structure is set up, the term saturated comes from every chemical bond they have available on the fatty acids is taken. Therefore, these saturated fats can stack up and be really close together and clog arteries. Yep. The unsaturated fats are, well, essentially there's the monounsaturated fats and the polyunsaturated fats. And these think of the fatty acids instead of the straight line, they're kinked. Mm -hmm. So they don't have, they have a bond, they have an area that is not taken um, from the, from the hydrogen and they are less saturated they're not saturated with hydrogens and these are the heart healthy ones so we're looking the monounsaturated fats um avocado avocado oil olive oil the polyunsaturated fats we're looking at fatty fish so like salmon and tuna we're looking at mm -hmm. walnuts we're looking at walnut oil which is another great kidney friendly oil flaxseed flaxseed oil sunflower seeds sunflower oil safflower oil as well these are the polyunsaturated fats and this is where it also is great to think about variety and not worry about fixating on just one of these things in the diet because there are benefits to including others. You get other nutrients from these other types of healthy fats. So the polyunsaturated fats in particular have the omega-3 and omega-6s, which are really, really good. Those are both very important fatty acids that our body utilizes to do a lot of anti-inflammatory work and protection for our body. So very, very helpful. They've also been shown to lower cholesterol levels and take care of even things like, um, well, I mentioned the inflammation, heart disease mm -hmm. is another one, and even blood pressure. Omega-3s have been shown to be helpful in controlling blood pressure. So this is, again, another reason to not be thinking that you can't have these oils because there's a lot of good benefits to them. So many. As a matter of fact, I just went to the blog on plantpoweredkidneys.com, which is, covers what we're talking about today and so much more. Link in the description, everybody. And I just grabbed a screen grab. Oh, let's see. Can I shrink that down? Darn it. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I don't know how to shrink yeah. it down real quick in real time. Let's see. Can I figure this out? Nope, I can't. Darn it. That's but okay. I can a, tell you. I made yeah, it you myself, got a great so picture of the kidney friendly oils that we've talked about, including safflower. I've actually never safflower. heard that. Yeah, yeah. They you'll you might find it in some of those like kind of kitschy um, uh, artisan type jars, like you or or almost like the bottles. I've seen them like that next to walnut oil and safflower or sunflower oil. Um, it's it's another more neutral oil to use. Um, you don't have to include it, but it is, sh I do include it there as an option to be a more kidney friendly option. Yeah. And more options is great. Exactly. Now, with kidney disease, we, we all keep an eye on our potassium. Is that also something that if I have diabetes, I also have to be careful with? Well, this is 
I mean, we talk so much about potassium, like potassium mm -hmm. is a huge conversation for the plant powered kidneys course. We spend the first week talking about potassium. It is something that may or may not need to be restricted in a diabetic diet. It's not, if it's just a diabetic diet, it's not typically looked at very, very rarely. If it's looked at, it could be because there's some suggestion that the kidneys aren't working as well because kidneys should be taking care of the potassium. Not always, because we know there's other factors like medication and blood sugar issues that can affect potassium as well. So it does connect in with diabetes. But the reason that I included in my article is to once again highlight that just when we're thinking about the renal and the diabetic diet, you want to be aware of your potassium because it can be anywhere from 2000 milligrams to over 4,700 milligrams a day. It's a very, very big um, range for your potassium needs. And you won't know exactly how much unless you talk with your healthcare team. So your doctor should first of all be screening you to see if you are needing to restrict potassium and then if that's the case should be referring you to a dietitian to help you with determining what that should look like in your day-to-day -day diet um typically i mean you know that i don't want to restrict anything if we don't have to and potassium is definitely one of those things that i don't want to restrict unless i have to because potassium just like those healthy fats they do a lot of good things for the body and most people don't get enough potassium anyway so mm -hmm. One of the things I do with clients when we first start working together, even before our very first session, I say, okay, I need you to give me a few days of a food journal. What if you mm -hmm. do it already, upload it to me. If you want to do it, here's the portal access that you can check that out and you can use it there. I need to see what you're up to now so that we can determine what your starting point is because again, most people don't get enough potassium. Why would I be focusing on restricting your potassium if you're mm -hmm. already eating so little of it? In fact, most of my clients, I end up pushing to eat more potassium because they're getting so little. So it, it's not something that you assume that you shouldn't be having. If anything, it's something you question if you should be having more of. Very good. And I'm one of those rare kidney patients that I needed a higher potassium diet. Uh, mine stays on the low end and I get to enjoy having a higher potassium. I get to have a bit more avocado than normal. Uh, and I honestly, I don't think it's that rare anymore. I, 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 at least from my experience, the more people, the more clients that I work with, I am not restricting potassium very frequently. We are re-educating on how much you should be having, but I think more people out there, um, I, I think there's just more conversation that needs mm -hmm. to be had about understanding the potassium that you should be having. Yeah, I think the the knee jerk reaction with kidney disease is limit potassium, and yeah. it, that's not exactly the case. You you limit if you're if you have trouble with it going too high, because um, too little is just as bad as too much. And I've seen exactly. enough people that are low on stuff. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, Sugar Ray's talking about uh, half a banana instead of a full one. It's a great way to get something you like in without overdoing it with mm -hmm. potassium. Um, now, one thing people always love to ask is what foods are okay to eat? Uh, can you share some foods? And I, I know they're listed on the blogs. Mm -hmm. We're not gonna be able to cover all of them, uh, but what are some of them? Just give people an idea that it's not as bad as you think. Yeah, well, <laughs> Of course, I love to start with fruits and vegetables. And if if you have a concern about your potassium, if you don't know really where you stand, you can always start with focusing on more of a variety of the low potassium options. So we're looking at essentially the berries, we're looking at asparagus, we're looking at cabbage, um, oh my gosh, watermelon, lemon, lime, plum, apples, um, I said raspberries, They're tangerines. They're my favorite apples. <laughs> yeah, we're looking at onions and peppers, like onions and peppers for me every day. We're having stuffed peppers for dinner tonight. It's it's an, those are both every single day for me. Um, we have um, celery, we have cauliflower, arugula, um, mushrooms, water chestnuts, which are so great to add um, to give a nice fresh crunch. 
there's so many fruits and vegetables. And if you need to, again, focus on low potassium, start there and then see what you can add in. Otherwise, if you don't need to worry about potassium, then you have that much more to be able to enjoy. Mm -hmm. Then we have our whole grains. So we're looking at any kind of whole wheat bread, whole wheat pasta, um, uh, brown rice is really great. So is wild rice. The amounts of rice that are available is absolutely mind blowing to me. Um, I guess our grocery stores, we can see there's like a whole aisle dedicated to rice these days. But so, do you know what my favorite rice is? And it's not available everywhere. I've mentioned it on here before. Do you remember? Purple rice. Purple rice. Yes. It's got more fiber in it and it's got a yeah. flavor to it. It's popular in Korea. See, yeah, I think I think any of those kinds of rice that you really enjoy, and if you're not sure if it's a whole grain, take a look and see what the fiber content is. If it has no fiber in it, it's missing a piece of the grain. It got literally it got stripped of a part of the grain, therefore it is low or no fiber. So check that fiber content to figure out where it stands on the complex carbohydrate side of things. So. There are so many different types of grains as well. Um, that's another one. You know, there's farro and sorghum and um, quinoa is another great staple. Oh, yes. Um, Durham, Kamut, Kamut, Kamu, I have a hard time saying that one, Kamut. Um, there's so many different kinds that are I don't even try. I'm available. so bad at that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and grains, similar to oils, is one of those things that I see misunderstood in so many of those Facebook groups that – they're not really support groups, um, but they, they'll tell people, stay away from all the grains, stay away from all the oils. And that's just not the right advice. It's not coming from a dietitian. It's not supportive. <laughs> it's not, I mean, how can you fill up your plate with a bunch of don't eat this and don't eat that? Mm -hmm. That's that's why I always get confused. I don't yep. think it's going to take you very far. Um, so some of the other things to go, go through the categories really quickly, we have our lean proteins. So I do focus on more plant proteins. We're looking at beans, nuts, and seeds. Um, even some cheeses like cottage cheese, that was a big one that I would promote, especially in dialysis. It was easier to get protein in. Um, tofu is a fantastic option. Tempeh, but just keep in mind, tempeh is very high in protein. Uh, so it adds up pretty fast. I'm sorry, Lucy's running around in the yard and she's distracting me because she's just running back and forth. <laughs> you know, earlier I was I was on a work call and my big dog, who's a, a great Dane golden retriever mix, came in here and just wanted his head petted for like 10 <laughs> minutes. <laughs> and you can't like hide chill, him. So. He's big. Oh yeah. She's just um, I'm like, what is she what's happening out there? Anyway. Anyway, so we've got the lean proteins. We have our healthy fats, which we did. Uh, we did run through those healthy fat options for you guys. Nuts and seeds also do include healthy fats. So that's another great resource. A lot of these things provide multiple nutrients, which is, again, a really good benefit of having a variety of your diet that you get to kind of check off more boxes of the things that you want to include. Um, and then the other group that we hadn't yet talked about too much were like beverages, drinks. Mm -hmm. So... Number and some people one, ask some water. questions about those. What were like some soda examples they might be able to drink? I mean, sodas, I'm, I'm kind of with you, James. I'm not a big soda fan. I stopped drinking soda um, in high school when I was playing volleyball and our coach had us do like a no soda thing for the season. And then after that, I just stopped drinking it. Um, there is a brand, someone had, um, someone had messaged me, one of our plant powered kidney students Starts with an messaged S, me. Right? Uh, no, maybe you're thinking of the one that starts with a Z. Or a Z, Z, Z. Yeah, because I, I used to see them all the time at the kidney walks. Yeah, so Zevia is one That's of the it. brands. Yeah, they're a bit pricey, and so I think some people think that the price doesn't justify it, but they don't have any added phosphorus, which I think is really, really good, and they use more natural sugar substitutes. So that would be a brand that could potentially work. Um, another one I'm looking at is I think called Olipop. And they include probiotics in their sodas and they're lower in calorie. Yeah. So I'm, I'm just kind of testing them out. I'm not promoting them whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Not, I'm not promoting Zevia. Those are just some options that are out there. Um, but I'm kind of checking it out to see some options. I got some when my nieces came out to visit and they liked them. So I'm like, okay, well, you know, that's, that's good to know. Um, but they're also a more pricier option too. So um, those are some options, but you can also do things like ginger ale, 
some of the lemon lime sodas can work too, but some of them do have some potassium. So mm -hmm. keep in mind if that's something that you need to focus on, just be aware that even sodas will have potassium in them. Um, your juices with a renal diabetic diet, you definitely want to be really careful with juice again, because that will that doesn't have fiber. So it will shoot up your sugars. If you do have juice, make sure you have it as part of your meal and not by itself. And that will help slow down the absorption of the sugars that come from uh, that come from the juice. Yeah. And one note about the sodas. Um, and I learned this in the very beginning because I had to wean myself mm -hmm. off. I was a Dr. Pepper, sit down, have dinner, two liters. Oh my goodness. I can't believe I used to drink that stuff. But I found, um, I went to root beer after that. It's like, okay, let me mm -hmm. wean myself off. And I went with root beer and I found one, no phosphorus. They changed the formula, did not change the label. They did change the mm -hmm. ingredients to reflect it. So kind of a warning, if you have a soda yeah. and you're like, okay, that one doesn't have phosphorus. When you buy some, double check, just to make sure they didn't mm -hmm. change the formula. Look around the back, PHOS, well, oh, that stands out. I can spot it from an arm's length away on the label. Yeah, yeah, same here. <laughs> exactly. Now, what are some foods that I may need to limit? I'm not saying avoid, but I may need to limit if I'm on a diabetic renal diet. So the first thing, of course, is going to be sugar. Sugar is only going to be aggravating the diabetic side of things. It's only going to be causing some problems there. Again, it's not something to avoid entirely. Uh, the daily sugar allowance for women is six teaspoons, which is 25 grams. And for men, it's nine teaspoons, which is three or 37 and a half grams of sugar per day. But if you ever take a look at the back of your soda can, even your coffee drink, um, even your flavored yogurt, like fruit flavored yogurt, you can see the sugar can add up pretty darn quick within that parameter. So be really careful with anything that is added sugars and the new nutrition labels do a good job. When you look at sugars on the nutrition list, it'll, or on the, on the uh, ingredient nutrition facts, there we go. It'll say added sugars and it'll give the grams there. That's what you really want to pay attention to and try to be careful with that because like we said, the complex carbs, you do get sugar, but it comes in the form, uh, it comes attached with fiber, which is what's really helpful. So simple sugars you want to be careful of. Fructose, which is the fruit sugar. Mm -hmm. So fructose, fruit sugar, that is something to be, you want to include it because again, your fruits do have fiber except for fruit juice. But just be aware that if you do have something like fruit juice or something that's like concentrated, like dried fruit, mm -hmm. um, that might set your sugars up a bit higher because you're going to get more carbohydrates and not as much fiber in some of those situations. Um, and it's so but, easy to eat that compressed or dried fruit. Just, oh, yeah. oh my goodness, I could down so much. It's hard to manage the portion because when you're eating it without the water in there, it feels like, oh, I just barely had any, but no, you just ate oh, yeah. half of one. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you think about, you think about a handful of grapes versus a handful of raisins. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it, it looks like the same. They're both a handful, but if you count it out, how many grapes compared to how many raisins, it Ooh. would be, it would be a difference and yeah. it would also reflect in the nutrition as well. Yep. Um, so I'm, I'm limiting my sugars. What else do I need to limit? So I do want to say along the sugar line, be careful with your sugar substitutes. The what's considered non-nutritive sweeteners, meaning these are sugar substitutes that don't have a, an effect on your blood sugar levels. These are okay. And these are kidney friendly to include, but they shouldn't be something that overtake your diet that you look to find uh, how many ways can I add this and what kind of recipes and what kind of things can I make to where I use these things. So some of the ones we talked about this morning were um, Splenda and monk fruit sweetener. Um, I think Stevia may have come up or Truvia, um, but those are all considered to be totally fine to fit in the renal diabetic diet as a component of the diet, not not an A, let's see how much we can get. Um, the sugar alcohols, those are also potentially okay to include, but 
again, something to limit because if you have too much of the sugar all the alcohols, which are like erythritol, mannitol, uh, sorbitol, think of O all at the end, alcohol, sorbitol, those sugar alcohols are more commonly, um, they can cause some GI upset, they can cause a diarrhea mm. if you yes. have too much of them. And this is something when we talk, we've talked about gut health and how important it is to have a healthy gut. If you have something that's kind of setting things off and causing diarrhea, then you have a disturbance in your digestive system. So it's not something that you want to do routinely. And if you do find yourself having that, it's definitely a sign to be pulling back on those sugar alcohols for sure. Yep. And I, you know, that whole gastrointestinal upsetting is not worth it. So no, keep an eye out. not at all. <laughs> When I, when I first tried to do keto without a dietitian, which did not go well, um, I did way too much of sugar alcohol because it's in all the keto foods oh, uh, yeah. or in so many of them. And yeah, that is not a problem we want to face. No, it, it's really not. So, um, and, and for those of you, we're not starting a whole conversation about keto. We did a whole other episode about yeah. keto. Um, <laughs> but that that's just another thing to be considering. So another area that you want to be careful of in the diet, we talked about the healthy fats. So now we're going to talk about the unhealthy fats a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And the unhealthy fats, we're looking at your saturated and your trans fats. So again, your saturated fats, they're in your fatty meats, they're in your dairy products, they're in um, lard, they're in like Crisco, things like that. And these saturated fats are really not good for our body. Another area that saturated fats are found in are processed and packaged foods, which in promoting a plant-based diet, that's something that we're not going to be looking at too much anyway. So mm -hmm. this is one of those things that if you're following that foundation of including more plants in your diet, you're not going to have the availability to get more of these processed foods in. So it's a little bit less of a concern. And then the trans fats are the ones, it, trans fats have been created by um, Food Corporation America, whatever you wanna call it. It's been created because it makes an excellent preservative. So trans fats have traditionally been found in packaged, frozen, processed foods, but the um, USDA has, or I'm sorry, the, um, yeah, yeah, the US, the U.S. Food and Drug the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. They are the ones who said, "Okay, trans fats are no longer okay." So companies have had to pull them out of their products over the years, and that's why you see trans fats listed on the nutrition tax, and it should be zero um, because they're not supposed to be using them. I think they have a little bit of time, or it was just last year that they were really pushing that. So. Trans fats you shouldn't be coming across, but that's a good thing. <laughs> yep. Um, we are almost out of time, and I do want to do one thing before we get to the top of the hour. But what are the other – there's so much more that we haven't covered that's in the blog with the link below. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that you think is important to include in this conversation here before we go to, the, um, go to wrapping things up in a few minutes? Hmm. Oh, there's so much more. Um, I know I'm looking through it. I'm like, Oh my goodness. You got, you got even sample menus of, Hey, here's what you can eat for breakfast, a snack, lunch, more snacks, dinner, a late okay. dinner snack, all sorts of great stuff in here and supplements. We did have someone ask about probiotics and fermented food. And that's another part. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think probiotics can be a great supplement and we've talked about Renadil, how we think that's mm -hmm. great. I have even other probiotics that I'll recommend for clients many times. Um, you can get probiotics in your diet as well, but with probiotic foods, you want to be careful of these other factors that we're looking at, like sodium. A lot of foods that have probiotics have salt in them for part of that fermentation process. Some of them are very high in protein which is something we need to be careful of for CKD. Some of them are high in potassium, and that's another factor that we need to be aware of. So when you're including probiotic foods, keep in mind of these other things that you wanna focus on or that you should be taking care of. And a probiotic is also one of the most common supplements that I recommend for clients because almost everybody benefits from it when it's helping with establishing a healthy gut and helping out with digestion, which is really good and protective for kidneys. 
Yeah, and I see sauerkraut, which when I was younger, there were a few things that I just completely avoided 100% and then somehow accidentally had them and realized I loved them and felt so bad for missing out on them. One mm. of them was avocados. I had avocado trees in my yard in California, male and female. So they produce tons of avocado. Then you need a male and female tree. Yeah. Uh, oh, wow. People don't know that, but mm -hmm. I, I would just pick them with the weird thing, this weird net thing and give them to the yeah. dogs. <laughs> And then I discovered I loved avocados, but I see sauerkraut, which I love sauerkraut, especially warm, warm it up. Oh, have you and ever tried sauerkraut on avocado toast? No, it does not sound good, but yeah. I will try it. <laughs> I've never tried that mixing. Yeah. It just doesn't sound like just something I would mix. It on top. Yeah. Oh. But I also see kimchi. Yeah, here's some of this kimchi, my baby. Favorites. Yeah, <laughs> oh. yeah. Having having worked in a, a Korean company, I used to work for Hyundai Motor America, the car people. And in our lunch, there was always kimchi available, and I came to love it. Um, and it's just so good for you, you know, once mm -hmm. you get used to it. <laughs> mm -hmm. I also um, there is a probiotic plant-based drink by the company called Forager. And it's kind of like kefir, which is a kefir is like a uh, probiotic enriched yogurt drink. But this one is plant-based. They use cashews and it's something I have all the time and it's just so good. And it's like my little strawberry milkshake that I get in the morning. One of my favorites. I really, really like it. So kefir is one of my favorites too. <laughs> now, before we run out of time, there are two things I want to do. First one let me, let me bring it all up here. Let me get all ready on here. So Ray is one of our regulars. I don't think he's missed, but maybe one show in, in three years or something, if that. Um, Ray is always here. His mom, which he calls mom because he's over in the UK, her name is Muriel. This Friday, the 25th of June, she will turn 84 years young. So I want to wish Muriel a heartfelt happy birthday from yeah. dad vice tv and we've got look all sorts of great birthday wishes for her let me bring those up on the screen <laughs> and i i know ray makes sure his mom's you know staying on her best kidney diet possible she is on dialysis so her diet is a little bit different than many of ours but it is great that she's sticking to her diet she's doing well and I feel like I know her. I've got pictures of her. Um, I've known Ray and his mom for pretty much at, since I've been diagnosed. <laughs> oh, well, thank you so much for sharing that, Ray. And happy birthday to Muriel. That is so wonderful to celebrate it with a bunch of kidney warriors. That is just yeah! so nice. From all around the world, too. Yeah, yeah. An international happy birthday. Yeah. And then the other thing I wanted to share real quick, now that um, kind of we're getting past um, the COVID lockdowns and things like that, I'm starting to get out and about more. And this Sunday, I had an awesome thing happen. I was driving down the street in my car with Dad Vice TV all over it. And someone weighed me down and came over to me. She um, is someone who was who received a kidney from her sister. And I oh. thought it was just so awesome. And she said, can I take a picture? And we took a picture together right there at the gas station. <laughs> oh, that's so nice. That's awesome. Yeah, so it was fantastic getting to meet a fellow kidney warrior. We stayed social distanced for the picture. Yeah. We talked, I think, for like 20, 25 minutes. We talked for a long time. <laughs> oh, that's so wonderful. <laughs> yeah. But it was awesome getting to meet someone again. I like that um, kind of getting out and about. I'm looking forward to hopefully soon or at least next year getting those kidney walks going again. So excited mm -hmm. about that. Absolutely. All right. That brings us to the top of the hour. Now, we did not get to cover everything. There is a link to your blog. And in your blog, you also have yourself a video of you from earlier today going through a lot of this. There's probably other questions that were asked that you answered that we didn't get to here. 
and additional information. So I encourage everyone to go to plantpoweredkidneys.com. You click on blog, you'll see it's the very first blog listed because it's the most recent. Um, there's also a link down below to take you directly to that blog so you can learn more. It's got list of foods. It's got meal ideas for like, hey, here's for the day, some examples of what to eat. So much great information. And if you post on the comments on the blog, Jen gets to see those. Mm -hmm. uh, wrong way. It's, it's weird. <laughs> for all of you guys out there, when I do point the wrong way, it's all mirrored for you guys, but not not for me here. <laughs> Jen is, is not over there. She's over th <laughs> that way for me. <laughs> but um, it's you can go in there, comment, and you might even get a response from Jen. You never know. I do. I do work really hard to respond because at least with the blogs, unlike social media, I don't get all of the alerts. I, I don't know what the deal is, but I don't get all the notifications for everything there. But on my website, I do get all of the questions that come up. So those I absolutely can't answer and I love to answer those. So feel free to post your questions on the blog. Yep, all right. It has been a great conversation, very informative. And I wanna thank you, Jen, for volunteering your time to share with all these kidney warriors and everyone out there. This is the last video of the week for me. So I will be back here next Tuesday with Jen again. We're gonna talk about more great stuff. So goodbye, everyone, and we will see you in the next video.